is uh, the founder of Pen Test Partner. Could you test my pen? <laughs> no. And he is he runs an ethical hackers firm, which should be exciting enough. Enough said. Over to you, Ken. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, before we start, I'm not an expert in AIS. My background is in industrial controls and the security of those devices. But to start, I put this picture up because it's, it's a mistake. I asked um, my marketing guy to do me a picture of some USB ports on a ship, and he gave me that. <laughs> What, what, I, what I really wanted was like some uh, USB ports on, a, like a, on a, uh, a, a conning display or an ECDIS, but he gave me that. So I kind of liked that. I thought that said a lot. A little bit about me. I, I'm part of a team of uh, 70 people who are, are penetration testers or ethical hackers. Uh, our background is in industrial controls and regular pen testing. We spend a lot of time testing cars cash machines, ATM, IoT, and lots of other fun things. But our, our real interest is, is in maritime. Now, when I first started looking at ship security many years ago, yeah, the big game changer for me was the advent of satellite communications. In the past, a ship at sea was broadly isolated. Maybe you had a sat phone, but that was protected by the captain because it was very, very expensive. Now, as satellite data costs have reduced, everyone is putting satellites on their vessels. And they're using airtime allowances to attract good crew. So it's really, really key. The problem I have is that connectivity has been introduced to ships before security has really got there. If you want to find vessels, you use Shodan. Who here knows Shodan? Show of hands, please. Cool. We know Shodan. It is awesome. You can search in real time for vessel satellite terminals on the public internet. One example, I've searched for a, a Cobham Sailor 900 here. It takes nothing to find it. There we go. That is a live terminal on the internet. What's interesting? Okay, the vessel name. Okay, that's interesting to me. Most interesting, GNSS. I've got a position. That's interesting. But the bit as a hacker is that, the software version, is disclosed to me without authentication. Now, I know there is an admin account bypass in that version. It's fixed by version 1.60 build 15. So I know, unauthenticated, that I can hack that terminal if I wanted to. That's really bad, right? Surely it should be more difficult than this. Surely we should find security more difficult to compromise. So I can get access to the terminal. But what we then started doing is realizing there was more you could do. I had GNSS. I had a software version. We also had AIS. What if we link those two data sets together? And we created a new data set that matched the ship by vulnerability with its real-time position. And this is the data set we started producing. We looked initially just at um, certain Cobham Sailor terminals, matched the GNSS position with AIS, so we knew the vessel name, the vessel position, and also matched up the version of software. So you've got, effectively, a real-time vulnerable ship tracker. We can track ships with vulnerabilities in their SAPCON unit in real time. We thought that was quite good fun. Um, this does update real time, but we've deliberately delayed the data. We don't want people going and hacking for real. So this data is about seven days out of date on our website. But it's that easy to find vessels to compromise. Now, that's great. But sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes we find the vendor hasn't even changed the vessel, the password on the SATCOM terminal. And we find this, that's from a vessel. Sometimes things got a bit better now. We've got one, two, three, four, five as the most. I found one, two, three, four, five, six two weeks ago. That was good. Things are improving a little bit. But the game changer for us that no one, I believe, really looked at is looking why those vulnerabilities are there. So we bought some very expensive SATCOM hardware. This is an example of one we bought. And we started looking inside. We didn't look at the web interfaces on the internet. We started looking at the serial connections and the IP connections and then took it apart and looked at the firmware and found all sorts of crazy vulnerabilities in various manufacturers' firmware running on their SATCOM terminals. Mostly because the software's out of date, but give you some examples of things we found. So firmware, so the code running isn't signed, so anyone can roll back the code with unsigned firmware and introduce vulnerabilities. We found unencrypted logins, so Telnet, who uses Telnet nowadays? Wow. And also privilege escalation. So whilst there was an attempt to um, segment privilege, so not everything ran as root, actually you could run any arbitrary command as root if you wanted to. But the bit that made me laugh the most was we found that in the firmware. 
what is going on? <laughs> That's crazy. But SATCOMs can also help you if you can't hack the terminal. Uh, if you cannot compromise the vessel through the terminal, maybe it is patched, what about using it as a vector to fish? And a great example was here from a company called KVH, who actually I really like. I think KVH have got a really good secure um, SATCOM terminal program. But they had some vulnerabilities in an early least cost routing device called the Combox. And there was something really cool. You could find them on Showdown. And if you can see just here, I've highlighted, it says active crew users. And you can actually click and display pre-authentication, the crew roster, on the vessel. So we've got the guy's name. This is Marvin Andrada, displayed there. I can also see the vessel name. And there you go, Facebook. I've now found the guy who works for Schiffart. He's a deckhand, and there's a picture of the Dawn Horizon. So the SATCOM has given me the information to fish the people on board the ship. So SATCOMs is the game changer. Why is this? Why is software not kept up to date? I think one big problem is... Security updates are often hidden in the change logs. So this is a change log for an update to some SATCOM terminal software to do with bearings, frictions, and also this. There was a patch for an admin account login bypass hidden in the change log. Now, if you got a patch for your phone that said there was a security flaw, you'd fix it. And I think SATCOM terminal vendors need to step up and make sure they are pushing updates. Because right now, someone comes along, they install the terminal on the vessel. It never gets updated, ever. And then the ship gets hacked. Now, I often have an objection saying from uh, ship's crew saying, it won't happen to me. Surely banks get hacked, not ships. Well, that's great. Of course banks get hacked. But they've spent huge amounts of time and money on their security, so it's much harder. The other major problem is we don't have statistical data because if you are hacked as an operator, you don't tell anyone. You keep it very quiet. Although there is some anonymous data starting to come out from a facility called CSO Alliance, where crew and operators can report hacking incidents anonymously. And we're starting to see some good um, data there. But the things that make the press, Maersk, Costco, they weren't hacks. That was collateral damage from nation state attacks. Yet it's still trash businesses. Most of the attacks we see right now are from kids, they're from ransomware taking an exit or collateral damage. So we're not seeing yet huge hacks, but they're going to come. And I then see ship's masters. They say, you can't hack my ship. You can't hack it because if we were hacked, I would take manual control. And they would do manual helm. And they would do manual engine control. Great. But in order to take manual control, you've got to know you've been hacked. And I think the movies here do not help us because... Ship's crew think that a hack is crossbones and a skull on your ectus. It's not. It's much more subtle. It's little bits of tampering with data. So if you don't know you've been hacked, you can't take manual control. So here's some examples of how we think it could be done. This is uh, an example. So we started looking at ectus. And we got access to over 20 different ectus units. And we started looking for interesting vulnerabilities. And the first one, well, we found loads of crazy stuff. We found Windows NT. I've forgotten how to pen test Windows NT. I had to go back to tools from 10 or 15 years ago. But here's a great example. We found loads of crazy vulnerabilities. Um, we managed to get root on virtually every Ectis we looked at. So we've got a warship Ectis on the left there. That's fun. And this is a very popular commercial Ectis on the right. And we managed to get them both to run Rick Astley singing, never going to give you up. On the left, that's IE3. Wow. So we've got full root. Every, we can do anything we want to this Ectis. We found a Linux ectis, which I'm not going to put too much up here, about, but we found we could edit the raster chart data. Do anything, anything you want. And we also found through messing around with network interfaces for the ectis, we found we could reconfigure the ectis and feed it um, incorrect data. So a good example of that, we managed to tell the ectis that the GPS receiver was in a different place on the vessel and managed to get the vessel to move itself to the far side of the um, breakwater in um, Dover. We found another amusing configuration interface. We also discovered that you could reconfigure what the ship looked like using the, um, using the Ectis. Some modern AIS can receive data from the Ectis, so it auto-populates. We managed to grow the transmitted size of the ship to one kilometer square. Now, OK, you look out the window, there is nothing there. It's not one kilometer square. But what if you're using your Ectis, you're using look-ahead mode, you're looking for closest point of approach, and your Ectis is going, collision. What does the captain do? They probably stop and radio and think to avoid a collision. But it's all confusing. 
Captains say, it's okay, the ectus is wrong, I will cross-check my position with the ARPA. I use synthetic radar. That's fine. We could do exactly the same with synthetic radar. We can inject offsets and move everything so the bad position matches. Uh, other crazy things. This is, um, this is where it starts getting towards AIS. Is We started looking at ship's GPS receivers. Now, this all started uh, a little while back. And we started looking from our knowledge of industrial control systems, we started looking at the serial networks that were used to control ships. We found vessel operators that assured us there was no link between the IP network, so the crew network, the bridge systems, and there was no link between that and the serial network. So we took the side off the ECDIS. Oh, look, IP and serial in one box. We started looking at the wiring, wiring diagrams for a, a typical ECDIS, IP and serial in the same place. And then I got lucky. I found a voice data recorder storage module on eBay. Wow. How unusual is that? It was shipped in from India, from a breaker's yard. Now, this is the remote storage module. So when you have an incident that doesn't involve loss of the ship, typically the captain will press the store button, otherwise known as the career suicide button. You store that data, you lose your job, right? So why would you press that button? Crazy. But anyway, you're supposed to store the data on this. It's a hard disk, that's all. And it stores the recent event log so the, the incident can be analyzed. Now, the data had been deleted, but we're forensic experts. We recovered it in seconds, and we found lots of really interesting Namir sentences. All sorts of fun stuff. The ones we started with with GPS, no surprises there. And we thought, hang on, everyone is focused on GPS jamming and spoofing. But what about the ship network? If you compromise it on the ship, let's tamper with the data on the serial network on the vessel. Let's not mess around with jamming and spoofing, because you can detect that. So we did a demo. It's on our website. I think I've got a picture of it just over here. You can actually see in real time how you can mess around with GPS data and tamper with it and inject rogue positions. Not difficult. Now, it's just serial data. It's unauthenticated. It's an Amir 183 sentence. The only validation is a two by XOR checksum. There's a GPS autopilot command. Shift it left, right, change the checksum. Rudder goes the wrong way. Wow, this is getting silly. Other types of data we might find. AIS, we know all about that. Navtex, the watch alarms. Number of times when we're looking at uh, Lemire sentences involving the, uh, the watch alarm and the watch alarm switched off. Great, keys in, it's off. Okay, that's not so good. Navtex data, fascinating, but AIS, I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs because we're not AIS experts. There was some great work done with, by Trend Micro four years ago. I think that's great because they looked at the data that was being transmitted. What they didn't look at was the potential to manipulate that data on the boat in the same way that you can do with GPS data and other types of data on the vessel network. Now, I'm not going to teach you how to decode AIS because you know it all, but... What about simple things like tampering with data? We've always assumed it's about messing around with position, but what if you were to send aero notices? What if you were to start talking about ordnance, mines, explosives at sea? How do you validate that data? I thought it was fantastic that Trinity House suggested uh, a message 17 GNSS correction. How much fun would that be? And what about sending rogue messages around dredging or fishing in, in uh, restricted areas? You cause chaos. You're sending messages to fool people which means they disregard the valid ones. Wow. So I'm sure lots of you are looking at the potential for public-private key cryptography. That's great. What it completely overlooks, though, is the fact that you can still transmit from a valid receiver with valid MMSI and encryption key. You also have huge problems with key distribution. You know, the one-time pad is the best method of encryption, but distribution of the one-time pad is the problem. So how do you share that key? Real significant issues. But the area I really want to leave you with is... I don't think I've seen much. I haven't seen much research in the public domain into the hardware security of AIS transceivers. I think there's huge opportunity there. I've got a couple of all on order. They're expensive, surprisingly, so for our own research, it costs a lot of money. If anyone's got any information about the security of hardware AIS receivers, I'd be fascinated to hear, but we'll be doing a project over the coming months looking at how someone can hack the transceiver in the same way you can hack the SATCOM terminal. Now, what about Navtex? Same method. I don't know. I'll just mess around with the data and send rogue information. I'll cancel a valid Navtex alert. 
or I'll generate a spoof one. You need a huge aerial to do this because it runs shortwave. Much smaller than you, sorry, much larger than you need to do a spoof AIS message. But you still cause issues for up to four hours. All sorts of crazy problems there. Now, I was going to talk about lots of other fun things to do with um, plain text protocols we find in shipping. But one that bothers me the most is Edifact, the EDI messaging system that does containerized um, movements. I think you could do crazy things such as destabilize containers by mess messing around with a verified gross mass of a container by tampering with the Edifact messaging system. I think you could cause containers to be misreported as load. We always do VGM for Solas, but you can tamper with that data and get containers mishandled. You could suppress message alerts that do things like dangerous goods. You could suppress the hazardous good codes like explosive substance so the container's mishandled. You could have some fun, play around with reefers, and mess around with the handling codes for um, refrigerated goods. Here's a good one for you. This is an Edifact handling code for um, a reefer. You look for ACC, so AC powered bay. So the Steve Dawes put the reefer in the correct powered bay. So let's just remove that and say it's a non-operating reefer. So they put it anywhere. So if you've got frozen fish in that container, now it's getting warm. And maybe you look around for an odor sensitive cargo, so typically coffee, and you set the open door command on both handling codes. So defrosting fish, and coffee, great. So then you look for an odorous cargo, like your fish, and then, for good measure, you use Cape Dry, the handling code to put the container under the hatch covers, where it's warm and not very well ventilated. So now your fish gets really hot and really stinky, and it's next to your coffee, which is now going to taste really good. Prawn espresso, I think. But actually, that seems silly, but yet you could use very similar techniques to disguise shipments of arms and narcotics. So this is serious. You can also steal money using Edifact as well. There's financial information instructions, a cent, plain text using EDI. This is great. Bank account numbers. Wow, perfect for fraud. Now, if you verify this against your bill of lading, hopefully you're safe. But do you always check? I don't know. We've also seen very similar methods used for stealing containers. Um, the reason we know about this is there was a legal case between Glencore and um, MSC that uh, occurred in 2012 uh, was prosecuted, uh, there was a legal suit in 2016 and an appeal in 2017. The PIN codes for the, um, the truck driver to recover a container were stolen. So when a legitimate driver went to the port, put in his PIN, the container wasn't there. Two containers with $1.1 million worth of cobalt metal disappeared. This happens, this is real. Container load theft is happening partly through this. Go and read the legal papers, they're really, really interesting. I've just blogged them. Blockchain, stuff that. Some advice. Yeah, blockchain, don't, just don't. Um, some basic advice for operators primarily. Number one, sort the SATCOMs out. If you sort the SATCOM terminal out, you've removed a huge attack surface for the hacker. Update the software, change the passwords, make sure it stays that way. Segregate the networks. Don't join your serial and IP networks without serious consideration. And then... There are some good standards emerging. So IEC 611.62.460 describes the interconnection and segregation between um, uh, digital networks on the vessel. And 470 is on its way, which looks really good as well. USB hygiene is critical. But the most important thing I think any operator can do is ask their suppliers of technology for evidence that their systems are secure. If you do not ask for security, you will not get it. And finally, teach your crew. Be Cyber Aware at Sea is a great campaign. There are lots of other cool ones too. I'll leave you with that. That's us. That's what we do. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. I'm sure this fires a few questions uh, and remarks, and I see a first hand up there. Okay, question from our student from FH Lübeck. Um, I'm just wondering um, what are the reasons why, I don't know if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you know the reasons for that, but why are people, people like connecting open ports to, to hardware that is sensitive when, when there's the obvious threat that it is dangerous? Okay, so that threat's obvious to you and me, I think many of the people in this room. I don't think that threat is obvious to mariners, operators and technology installers for vessels. Um, security is a very new thing for maritime operators. 
Um, the vessel didn't matter before because it was isolated. Mm -hmm. Now we have satcoms, everyone just starts hooking things in for telemetry, for engine efficiency management, engine performance, for example, crew management, and no one thinks about the hacker. They just want to make things work. So what we need to do is make sure that installers think about security and don't just hook up vulnerable open services. Lars? On, on what channel do you reach the SATCOM device installed on the vessel uh -huh. as a hacker? Oh, sure. It, ah. <laughs> it's, it's really, really easy. Uh, it's, it's usually port 80. In fact, just over here, uh, if we look at the SATCOM terminal I had open, so you can see it's actually running out actually running on port 8080, so HTTP, not HTTPS. Most of the time you find it on port 80. Sometimes you find it on port 443, but it's usually just there. It's really, really easy. To add that, I think there's also a search engine on the web where you can find open devices or so. So that, that would be Showdown, which I, I showed over here. There's, there's Showdown for you. So Showdown finds so, you. So even, even really unskilled people can, can do this. Yeah, like me. Yeah. <laughs> you can also use Showdown to find some cool things too. So you can find vehicles, you can find refrigerators, CCTV, ATMs. Showdown finds you everything, not just satcoms. And, and you also can find uh, AIS boxes sending NMAA data, and uh, there are also people and that would be give room for another uh, uh, presentation, how easy I can steal your AIS data. Probably I already have done it. <laughs> More questions? So uh, let me say, uh, for me, this was one of the highlights, and I think we had a really good and interesting uh, presentation on this. And I also would would uh, uh, ask all the uh, or give a, uh, the satellite providers, terrestrial people. Uh, most of you are sending unencrypted data via various ports uh, over internet, and if you use search engines like this, you can find all these open boxes. Yeah. yeah, good remark. Thank you. Uh, I've, I've, I was really surprised to after about 30 years that I worked with UN Edifact um, to see these codes again, and I remembered some of them. So um, I, I think what we have to, to consider is, of course, that a lot of this um, does not need to be implicitly secure or safe. It has never meant to be like that. There is always a transport layer, and there is a content layer. But you're showing us that they are all open books. and. And that, of course, should not happen. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with plain text data as long as you put a, a, a wrapper, an encryption layer around it. That, that's the key. There's nothing wrong with using the mirror, nothing wrong with using the Edifact as long as you put a wrapper around it to encrypt it. But it's not the case right now. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, obviously, we, we were thinking in isolation of, of a vessel, which is no longer true. And therefore, the degree of vulnerability has increased dramatically. Yep, Obviously, we've, yeah. we've connected something that was never meant to be secure yeah. with the internet. Okay. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Can you see my Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, so so I, I've been fired. Okay. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Just take a break, <laughs> Jürgen. Come back. Come back soon. Um, so. The next speaker is, is one of my, my colleagues in uh, Maritime Data Systems. And uh, almost one year ago, he was he was a rich man. And I...